Good day. Um, as I discussed in my two previous uh, videos, previous programs for this channel, the last couple of days have been disastrous for Ukraine. And um, we've had more news trickling in from the battlefields about some of the things that have been going on. Firstly, it's now clear that the Gorsky Zolotoy um, um, cauldron, entrapment, encirclement, call it whatever you wish, uh, uh, collapsed and collapsed incredibly quickly. The uh, Ukrainian forces there apparently barely put up any resistance and um, something like um, 1,800 of them were apparently there but they've mainly many of them have surrendered and the remainder that are still there are in the process of being rounded up and the russians there's been even suggestions from the russians which of course we always need to take with some skepticism but there's even been some suggestions from the russians that the troops the russian troops uh, that entered this um, cauldron which they tend to call the Gorskoy cauldron uh, met, met no resistance and as a result suffered no casualties whatsoever now as I said we need to be careful about that and it may also be the case that I'm misunderstanding some of the Russian reports but that's how it seems and um, Ramzan Kadyrov the leader of Chechnya who's also uh, a military commander on the Russian side in this war has uh, spoken about the vast haul of weapons that the Russians have captured in this cauldron. An indication of how um, strongly the Russian military performed or feel that they performed in closing and crushing this cauldron, um, um, an indication of this um, has been provided by the fact that the Russian high command has very unusually named the commander, the military commander, who is in charge of the Russian forces that um, basically swept through uh, this cauldron, the Gorskoy cauldron, and affected Ukrainians, Ukraine, the Ukrainian defeat there. And we learn that he is General Surovikin and that he is a commander or the commander of the group of forces south now perhaps the other information the other news is even more dramatic because the russians are now also claiming that their troops are on the southern outskirts of lysychansk and um, this is very remarkable because it would suggest an enormous advance by the Russians all the way up to Lysychansk from their front lines, which has happened much faster than some people have suggested. And um, the Russians are now saying that there's been fierce fighting taking place um, in the industrial areas of Lysychansk at a gelatin factory and a rubber products plant and at a glass factory, all in the southern outskirts of Lysychansk. And there's also some reports that the very large and very important Lysychansk um, oil refinery has actually been captured by the Russians. Now, the speed of this advance is, if it's actually happened, is surprising. And there's been some suggestions that it must have been facilitated by some kind of airdrop in other words that the russians inserted paratroopers ahead of the troops their ground troops and that those paratroopers were able to um, seize and destroy some bridges and capture some territory until the mechanized units coming uh, um, coming towards lysychansk um, eventually caught up with them. Well, I, this may be true, but I have to say, I have to give a warning, there's been no reference from the Russians of any airdrop at all. And the, the Russian military def of defence has not mentioned that such an airdrop has in fact taken place. So this is purely a guess. It may be right, it may be wrong, <laughs> I don't know. But so far, it's not been confirmed. 
what does seem to have been confirmed uh, is of a very rapid Russian advance to Lysychansk. And again, the Russians are perhaps indicating their pleasure at the speed of this advance by naming the uh, commander, the Russian commander who was in charge of the Russian troops that have carried out this offensive towards Lysychansk. And they've identified him as Colonel General Lapin in command of the um, Group of Forces Centre, whatever that means exactly. Um, I ought to say that there's an alternative report which says absolutely nothing about an airdrop but mentions that uh, some kind of armoured um, and tank advance, unusual in this war, and that it's been suggested that some of those T-80 tanks that I to talked about, the tanks with the gas turbine engines, which have enormous speed and acceleration, uh, that it was those tanks that were used and that some kind of armoured formation carried out this advance. And on the other side, we are now reading about how the Ukrainians are trying to withdraw from Severodonetsk, and it's been suggested and implied that they're also trying to withdraw from Lysychansk as well. And the commander of the um, um, Ukrainian armed forces, General Zaluzhny, is now apparently talking about maneuverable, maneuvering defence. And one reads elsewhere about the Ukrainians carrying out tactical withdrawals and strategic withdrawals from Severodonetsk and Lysychansk and about why they've retreated from Lys Severodonetsk, that the city has supposedly been completely destroyed so that there's no point in holding on to a ruin. These, it seems to me, are all rationalizations for what is now shaping up to be a very heavy Ukrainian defeat indeed. Now, yesterday I spoke in my previous video about how um, some U Ukrainian troops appeared to have made an attempt to escape from Lysychansk, and a, a column of these troops seems to have made that effort, but was shelled and badly uh, um, hit by Russian artillery and helicopter gunships and other Russian uh, forces. The Russians now have what is called fire control of all the roads leading into Lysychansk, and that this was uh, another military disaster for Ukraine in a period of disaster, and that this was an, a failed attempt, in, a, in effect, to retreat from Lysychansk um, with some equipment. Well, there's now been another suggestion. It's been suggested that, in fact, this was not a retreat as such. This was some kind of attempt by the Ukrainians to launch a counterattack in response to General Lapin's uh, uh, blistering advance. Well, how am I to say? I mean, I have no idea one way or the other. All that one can say is that whatever it was, a retreat or an attempted counterattack, in both cases, it failed and that the Ukrainians appear to have suffered extremely heavy losses. And it seems that the Ukrainian forces in Severodonetsk and Lysychansk, as I said yesterday, are now effectively um, contained in what is now essentially another cauldron. Um, there are apparently still dirt tracks and open fields across which the Ukrainian troops could withdraw, at least in theory, but it would be extremely difficult for them to do so, and they would expect to suffer heavy losses if they tried. Nonetheless, I suspect that is what increasing numbers of them will attempt to do. So there we are, um, a whole succession of military failures by Ukraine in Lugansk region, and Russian websites, bloggers, and to some extent the Russian media, are now essentially anticipating the complete clearing of Lugansk region, liberation as they would call it, uh, um, of Ukrainian troops from Ukrainian the Ukrainian troops within the next couple of days.
or perhaps a week. I mean, that's what they're speculating. We'll see whether it actually happens. So, a series of catastrophic defeats experienced by Ukraine in Lugansk region. Um, I'm not a military person. I've never understood the logic of trying to cling on to this area. I know there have been all, all sorts of attempts to explain it. As I've said, these all seem to me to be rationalizations. None of them come close to explaining the true reasons why this has happened. And it seems to me to have been all a succession of disasters. As for the re-equipping of the Ukrainian army with vast numbers of weapons from the West, well, I've already explained why I think that's not going to happen, why um, the dribbles of Western weapons that are coming in are, are not going to be anywhere near enough to change the picture, why there simply isn't sufficient time to train Ukrainian troops to use these weapons anyway, and why, based on that article from the Royal Inst United Services Institute website that I discussed the other day, it seems that the industrial capacity to produce weapons on anything like the necessary quantity simply doesn't exist, and that the United States military and indeed the militaries of other Western countries are now becoming increasingly anxious and are worrying that attempts to rearm Ukraine in that kind of way would dangerously deplete Western arm stocks. And before I proceed further with this, can I thank the very kind and warm words that the new Atlas, this is another YouTube channel, one of the best channels, in my opinion, in discussing the war in Ukraine. Can I thank the person who uh, um, gives actually extremely interesting breakdowns of events at the new Atlas for the warm words that he made about me and about my program on the question of the industrial um, issues. I would just say that on the issue of depleting Western arm stocks, I would repeat two points. If the US would struggle with to compete with Russia, then it really has no hope against the manufacturing colossus, which is today's China, and that the United States certainly cannot or should not deplete its stocks um, in a battle against Russia, given that it is already in military competition with China in the Pacific, whose industrial capacities are so much greater than those of the United States itself, and with the possibility, in fact the certainty, that the Chinese are building up their stocks of weapons, as we're speaking, probably on at scales and at levels that the United States would struggle or find impossible to compete with. But of course, there's another reason why depleting stocks of weapons in the West, and particularly the United States, is extremely dangerous, which is that, of course, we are living in an extremely unstable world. A couple of days ago, I was reading in National Interest, one of these foreign policy magazines that appear, uh, uh, that exist in Washington, that in fact proliferate there. And it was talking about how a war between Israel and Iran in the Middle East is now inevitable. And in fact, while we've all been focused on Ukraine, the situation in the Middle East has been getting more tense almost by the day. So we get reports now about attacks by Israel on Damascus airport. The Syrians have been making threats in response. There's tensions between Israel and Lebanon. And of course, there's this overarching issue of the possible struggle between Iran and Israel. Well, that's just one area where things could easily spiral out of control. And there are many other places in the world where the same thing could happen. Um, in Africa, there's wars raging in Ethiopia and Congo, and there's other potential places of struggle in Central Asia, 
the Afghan situation remains still very tense, and even in parts of Southeast Asia where there have been insurgencies and, of course, potential insurgencies in Central America, South America, in many, many parts of the world. Now, if you've taken it upon yourself to be the exceptional country, the hegemon, the, pers the country that must uh, take charge of every problem, then, of course, you need to have armed forces in reserve, properly equipped, that you can send to conflict zones in order to contain those conflict zones. But, of course, you can't do that if your armed forces, your military, um, has uh, given away all of its weapons to Ukraine, where those weapons are being systematically destroyed by the Russians. So I have absolutely no doubt at all that the Pentagon must be increasingly concerned by the, the accelerated pace of arms deliveries by the Biden administration at an earlier phase in the war. And as I've previously discussed in earlier programs, the actual pace at which the United States is sending weapons to um, Ukraine, far from accelerating now, is if anything slowing down. We received reports that the United States is going to send four more HIMARS systems. That makes eight in total. The uh, British and the Germans are apparently between them each going to send three, or rather six in total. So that means 14 HIMARS systems against the hundreds of multiple uh, launch rocket systems that Ukraine had at the start of the war of which many, many have now been destroyed, and of course the hundreds, endless numbers of these systems that the Russians also possess. So, and that seems, from the latest arms package, which is $450 million, to be the sum total of what the United States now is actually providing. The, the expectations, I think, that many people had of vast weapon numbers of weapons pouring into Ukraine, redressing the balance of the conflict, with the US doing in Ukraine something similar to what the Soviet Union and China did with Vietnam in the 1960s. That's not working out. And partly of the reason, as I said, is because of the limited industrial capacity of the United States, the military industrial capacity, of the United States at this particular present moment in time, and also the Pentagon's increasing worry that it simply can't afford, it can't risk to give away all its weapons. So that's where we are. Now, I discussed in previous programs, recent programs, the gathering economic crisis, and it's been in the West, and there's now growing comments, growing alarm being expressed in Germany in particular about the fact that the country is far from being prepared from the winter and um, the European Commission is now also weighing in. Um, supplies of gas from Russia are running down. The underground reserves are far from filled and the situation is looking increasingly precarious. And we have reports already that the German government is rolling out um, emergency gas rationing. And this, of course, is in summer, in June, long before the winter comes. So um, it's not looking terribly good there. Well, the Hungarian government has now come out and weighed in. And they've said that it is imperative that discussions, negotiations, be opened with the Russians immediately in order to achieve some kind of ceasefire and general settlement of the conflict in Ukraine. Now, the Hungarians have repeatedly gone out on a limb. They've resisted sanctions pressure. They've resisted uh, um, attempts to come out with all kinds of condemnations of the West. And, of course, they've come in for some criticism that they're pro-Russian in consequence 
I can't help but think that the fact that the Hungarians are now coming out so openly, and when I say the Hungarians, we've had a um, advisor of Prime Minister Orban speaking, uh, giving an interview, calling for a ceasefire to the Financial Times newspaper. I can't help but think that the Hungarians, again, have been put up to do this by some of the other European powers. Perhaps Italy, possibly Spain and Portugal, and uh, um, this advisor, who, by the way, he's also called Orban, though he's not related to Viktor Orban, the Hungarian Prime Minister, this advisor pointedly referred to the fact that support for the war in Spain and Portugal is collapsing. So, um, you, we see the Hungarians coming out and speaking openly about this. But perhaps there's another further sign of doubt, and that is that we learn that the um, um, European Union, European Union and NATO officials have been quietly briefing against Lithuania um, and its actions with respect to Kaliningrad to the media. I was reading again in the Financial Times an article which seemed to be sourced from EU officials, which said that uh, Lithuania basically uh, went off on uh, a frolic of its own. It acted by itself when it announced that closure of road and rail transport to Kaliningrad. And the EU has now made statements that, in fact, the only goods which are restricted are steel and uh, concrete. Um, it's only those sorts of goods which apparently are um, to be blocked from transporting to Kaliningrad across Lithuania um, and which are affected by the sanctions in this sort of way. Well, all I would say about that is that, of course, this attempt to distance the EU from Lithuania and from this extraordinary decision with respect to Kaliningrad is far too late in the day. Whatever the EU says, whatever NATO says, whatever Western leaders say, the, the situation, the cat, if you like, is now out of the bag. Lithuania, by its actions, has put the issue of Kaliningrad, of the transit to Kaliningrad, on the geopolitical map. The Russians, from this moment on, are going to uh, c c worry about Kaliningrad. They're going to say to themselves, the situation shows that Western powers are willing uh, to take these kind of steps about Kaliningrad. This means that Kaliningrad is now vulnerable to a potential rail blockade and road blockade. It's conceivable that at some point the NATO powers might try and impose a sea blockade on Kaliningrad as well. We hear all that they're saying, but at the end of the day, um, even as they try to distance themselves from Lithuania, they're not openly condemning what Lithuania has done. They're not coming forward and saying that the treaties that were agreed at the time when the Soviet Union broke up are sacrosanct and must therefore be adhered to. They are criticising, they're doing what they always do, they're criticising Lithuania in briefings, uh, um, anonymous briefings to the media. Uh, they're trying to water down a little what the Lithuanians have done, but they far from repudiated it. In fact, on the contrary, the United States has uttered publicly apparent words of support from Lithuania. So in light of this, Lithuania is now potentially threatened and we must revise our military strategy in accordance with that reality. And that may mean at some point that we're going to have to do something about the Baltic states. This has never been our plan up to now. We've always respected their independence. We may have absolutely terrible relations with them, but we have up to this point in time left them alone.
but we might not be willing or prepared to do that in the future. In the meantime, of course, we will take steps to um, retaliate this move. There's been suggestions of economic counter sanctions, which could be quite devastating, by the way, against the Baltic economies, which are not particularly strong. Um, but, you know, we'll see what the Russians do on that front. That's something I will discuss further when it happens. But the point is that from this moment, after this move, Kaliningrad, the area around it, is now a real potential flashpoint. Lithuania has wakened this sleeping dog and it's never going to be possible, it seems to me, to put this to to sleep again save with some sort of comprehensive settlement the outlines of which i'm not going to speculate or guess about now that points again to a further point the folly of nato's eastward expansion and indeed of the eu's eastward expansion what it has done is it has brought into nato and into the eu fragile uh, countries, nervous of Russia, very, um, incredibly hostile to Russia, and um, whose leaderships are unpredictable and have a tendency to lash out at Russia and do reckless things which then can compromise the position of the entire Euro-Atlantic bloc. I am sure nobody in Washington or London has any particular desire to get into some kind of war, th World War Three, with Russia over uh, the um, land corridor to Kaliningrad, over what's I believe called the Sulvaki Corridor, which separates Lithuania, which um, separates Belarus from um, Kaliningrad, and which has to cr cut across Lithuania. Nobody has thought of doing that in the West. That's never been. I suspect uh, um, the wish. There's all sorts of plans, but the Estonian Prime Minister has told us that she's been quietly told by NATO that in the event of a war, um, Estonia at least would be rapidly occupied by the Russians. There's nothing NATO can do to prevent that. And that the earliest that her country could expect to be liberated by a Russian counteroffensive is after 180 days, which is to say months after the war had begun. I don't think there's any possibility of NATO being able to recapture the Baltic states if they are occupied by the Russian military, uh, short of using nuclear weapons. And that gives us some idea of how dangerous this whole situation potentially is. So a disastrous decision by Lithuania pointing to the underlying folly of extending NATO eastward and indeed of extending the EU eastward. The Western powers now find themselves in a situation of potential conflict over an issue which by rights ought to have been at the end of the Cold War fully resolved with the various treaties agreed between the Russians and the Lithuanians which allowed transit over Lithuania to Kaliningrad. Well, there we are, folly upon folly. Um, we'll see whether the words of sense of rationality from Budapest are heeded. I suspect for the moment not, but I also suspect that before very long, uh, at some point, those words from Budapest, from Hungary, are going to be picked up by others. Well, that's me for the day. I re repeat again, I'm traveling quite a lot over this weekend. It may not be easy for me to continue to provide you with programs, but to the extent that I can, I will continue to do so. Thank you for joining me again today. Remember, you can find us on Locals and on Rumble and indeed on other platforms. You can also support us via Patreon and Subscribestar and by coming to our shop uh, where you can buy all sorts of 
great things like magic mugs, hats, hoodies, sweatshirts, t-shirts and all those things. And of course, last but not least, please remember to tick the like button if you've liked this video and to check your subscription to this channel. Well, as I said, I'll be back fairly soon. I'm not quite sure when, but in the meantime, have a very good day.